We're glad you're with us this morning. We're so glad we can be together. Um, so this morning, we're going to talk about grace, a really great topic, um, and ex- not just a topic of discussion, really, it's an experience of God's presence with us. And we're going to hear uh, how Jesus explains what grace is um, in the parable of the vineyard that will be read this morning as well. You received some chocolate. Don't eat it yet. I'll tell you when to do that uh, in a minute. So until then, let's stand as we worship. I was buried beneath my shame. I need you, God. 
There's honey in the rock Praying for a miracle time of, of confession, we were reminded, blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. If you take a moment, take that chocolate and go ahead and eat it. And notice how it tastes. Bitter, yeah? That's what sin is. Sin is bitter. It causes bitterness in us and bitterness around us. It looks good. It looks like it should taste good, but it doesn't taste good. And that's sin. So as we taste this bitterness, let's confess together. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and our failings. 
Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt though you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow you in your way of life. Amen. Hear the sweet good news. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in, the, in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power. Amen. Just know as we receive communion today, you're going to receive the sweetness of the blood of Christ in the wine. And receive the sweetness of God's grace coming to you in this gift of the sacrament as we gather together. Please be seated. All right, children, come on up forward up here for a message. Come on down. Yep, come on over. Have a seat right in front of me. Yay. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Honey in the Rock. By the way, as they're coming, was the, wasn't Honey in the Rock a really cool song? Oh, I love that. That was awesome. Woo, I had not heard that song before. Man. Great worship song. Talk about sweetness. All right. Hey, so let, tell me, why do you think God loves you? Why does God love you? Or why does God love anybody? What do you think? Let me, let's back, let me, let's put it one step this way. Why do you think your mom and dad love you? What's that? Because they, they care about you. Exactly. Okay. They love you because they care about you. Any reasons why you think, oh, my mom and dad love me because... I don't know. Yeah. Maybe there's no reason. Maybe the only reason your mom and dad love you, and maybe the only reason God loves you is even bigger than your mom and dad, bigger than your family. The only reason is because God loves you. That's it. It's kind of weird, isn't it? But think about this. Because God is love. That's what God, that's what they define, God can be defined as love. So why does God love you? God doesn't, God doesn't love you because you did anything great or didn't do something or because you're this or that. God, God doesn't love you with any criteria. Only reason God loves you is because that's what God does. God can't help but love you. That's, that's, what, that's God's job and God's faithful with that job. He loves you so much. And he's not going to stop loving you regardless of what happens in life, okay? So if you leave today knowing just because you are in existence today, God loves you, okay? Remember that. And tell somebody else that today, too. Like, hey, God loves you. Just tell them God loves you because it's true. It's absolutely true. Like, will you fold your hands with me? Close your eyes. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of your love, your grace that is sufficient and abundant. We pray your blessing upon these young disciples that they might receive in fullness your love. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks for coming up. Good morning, everyone. My name is Russell, and I'm going to try to get this bitter, nasty taste of sin out of my mouth. I feel so deceived at church on a Sunday morning. Unbelievable. I invite you to get out your Bibles, open up your Bible app, follow along with the words printed on the screen. We are actually going to read Matthew uh, chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven 
is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Well, because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only an hour, one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the entire day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for Denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do, I, to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of our Lord. So uh, our world's life in the past year has uh, fretted about and prayed over and been concerned about uh, the Russian incursion invasion into Ukraine, and, and rightly so. And, and uh, we, this is not a sermon about that, but it's just an illustration of what happens, right? N nation states, kingdoms across human history have done that same thing, right? Gone across borders to take over a land to do something on, on their own behalf to subjugate a people um, and to do whatever that is. In the parable today, um, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like dot, 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 and he tells us parable about what the kingdom of heaven is. So we're going to today focus on the kingdom of heaven and recognize that just as nation states do that same thing, God's kingdom breaks into our lives uh, to take over, but in such a gracious and good way. While nation states might have uh, a, a bad schemes and plans for the people that they are invading, God's kingdom is generous and kind to transform our lives. And the kingdom of heaven is that which breaks into our lives to our present moment. Um, just like that. Now, a friend of mine said this, kingdom of heaven can be defined as God's preferred future breaking into our present reality. So when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like, it's God's preferred future breaking into our present reality to change the present reality and move us toward a different future. That's what the kingdom of heaven is. So we're going to contrast that in a minute between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of, of this world. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's just say this. The kingdom of heaven, unlike any nation state in the world, the kingdom of heaven is not a geographical place. We might say, well, no, duh, but we just had to be, say, be clear. It's not a geographical thing. It's more about an ethos, a way of thinking, a culture unto itself, a, a way of being together. That's what an ethos is, if you looked it up in the dictionary. The kingdom of heaven is an ethos that's been around since the beginning of time. Just as the kingdom of world has a kingdom of this world, that is what we live in, no matter regardless of the culture we live in, they have its America has its own ethos, its own ways of thinking, ways of being together, the way we process life. That's an ethos. And in Jesus' parable of the kingdom of heaven, 
uh, under, in, embedded in that is a comparison between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world. But we also recognize that the kingdom of heaven, as I said, we'll get to that in a second, but the kingdom of heaven is primarily God's preferred future breaking into our present reality, to change our present reality to move towards God's preferred future. We experience that in small ways and big ways. We experience that, my hope this morning is, and every Sunday morning when we gather, that we experience the kingdom of heaven here. We experience God's breaking into our life through the sacrament, through the word of God's read, by being together in God's community. These are examples of God's kingdom, God's kingdom of heaven, breaking into our present reality that changes us, hopefully, into the future of the week that we have spend in our lives today. The kingdom of heaven broke into my life this past week. I, got, I had the opportunity to go to Florida last Sunday, and I was there through Thursday on a few days of retreat. Uh, went by myself to get away, to pray, to think, to reflect, to write, to be in silence with our Lord, to read his scriptures, to plan ahead for this year, next year for St. Luke, and so on. And in those four days apart, and it's not just me experiencing that, anybody who gets to do stuff like this, uh, we find the sweetness of God in the silence times, those silent times. We find God meeting us in those places. And God met me on those four days. It was in sometimes small and sometimes very big, profound ways. But certainly, God's promise is, my kingdom is going to be coming. And my kingdom continues to come in these and various and many ways. So, for every single one of us. Now, so here's the contrast between kingdom of heaven and kingdom of this world. As we unpack this parable that Jesus teaches. Now, we have to understand... Uh, uh, interpreting a parable, one of the parables, Jesus taught many parables. Anytime we interpret a parable, we understand that there's not just one answer of what this parable means, okay? That's the nature of a parable and the genius of a parable. There is, you could take a parable and look at it this way, that way, underneath it, but, I mean, and find a truth in it. So it's multifaceted. So today, we're looking at this parable through one perspective in a truthful perspective, to see the contrast between God's generosity and the kingdom of heaven and God and the kingdom of this world and the contrast. And let me just say this. What God desires is every single one of us on this planet experience abundant grace. That is God's preferred future for all of us, to draw us into relationship with Christ through abundant grace. We see that in this scripture. Okay. So, in this scripture, we hear Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, a vineyard owner, who's looking for workers. And what does he do? This, this vineyard owner, he says, he goes out to the marketplace and says, you're hired, you're hired, you're hired. He does that at 9 o'clock, at 3 o'clock, at 5 o'clock, at noon as well. What's the qualification for being hired in God's kingdom in this vineyard? This metaphorical vineyard. What's the criteria? What's that? Be unemployed. Be unemployed. Yeah, they go. One for one of them was. We don't have any. We're not working. You're hired. That's it. They some were just standing around. You're hired. There's like no qualifications. God just goes. I just choose anybody. I'll put anybody to work. I don't care. And isn't that the way who God is? God chose 12, as Brennan Manning calls them, ragamuffins. He chooses anybody and everybody to follow his son, Jesus. Regardless of background, regardless of expertise, regardless of intelligent level, it doesn't matter. It, nothing, literally nothing matters to God. What matters to God, God desires us to follow him. Matter of fact, uh, I've heard this point out that historically in the first century when a rabbi wanted to have followers to learn from him this certain way, that the 
those who wanted to follow a certain rabbi had to apply and have certain qualifications to say, here, I am worthy to follow you, rabbi, to learn your ways. And the radicalness of Jesus is that Jesus walked along and said, Matthew, come with me. This person, come with me. James, John, you're with me. And they had no qualifications. They didn't even apply. It's Jesus himself who says, in my heart, I want you. And he does that with every single one of us, even to this very day. He'll choose anybody because he knows he can use anybody and transform them and move them to do the work that only God can do. The kingdom of the world, the kingdom of the world says, you need to have qualifications, we hang around with people that we like, we do certain things with things we like, whatever it is. We have all these, we have all this criteria about people and who we're going to hire. And that's not wrong. I'm just saying it's a, it's a difference. If we expect the kingdom of heaven to be like this, we're wrong. Because God's saying, my kingdom is this way. The kingdom of heaven, God says, they're, everybody's equal. Right? At the end of the story, right? So people are paid a denarius, whether they worked eight hours or five hours or three hours or two hours. Everybody is treated equally. Now, we see where this clash is happening between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the world. Because at the end, right, at the end of the story, those who were hired first said, Whoa, wait a minute. I worked all day. And you're giving this guy who worked one hour the same amount of money you promised me? That's not fair. That's not fair at all. Because in the world's mind, we reward, we reward loyalty. Right? I flew in the kingdom of Delta Airlines this week. <laughs> it's a good kingdom. It's got comfortable seats. Got on the plane easily, and it was always in time. But the kingdom of Delta operates by saying, you have more miles with us, you can get on the plane first. You have more money, you can buy a better seat. You get a comfort plus seat if you have a little bit more money than the peons like me back in the back. <laughs> right? Or whatever. Because we operate with this normal understanding that we have haves and have nots. Some are treated better than others based on their standing or whatever that is. And if you're in first class, you get free drinks and food while everybody else doesn't. Sorry, that's our kingdom. And we all go, okay. But the king, that's not God's kingdom. God says, in my kingdom, everybody's treated the same. There's no express lines. Nobody gets to come to the communion first because of their standing. Everybody comes equally as they are. Nobody gets an upgrade in heaven based on merit, that's outside the bounds of God's kingdom. We can't say, well, God, look, I, look, look at all the things I did compared to that person. Look at all the great merits I've built up. Look, after all, Jesus, I served as a Lutheran pastor in the church. Don't I deserve an upgrade in your kingdom when I die? God says, no. My grandfather did this or that, or my family went to church all the time. Doesn't that give me some merit somewhere in your kingdom, God? God says, no, because everybody is treated equally. It's not based on you. It's based, God would say, on me and my generosity. This story, that parable of a vineyard, has echoes of another story Jesus tells of the prodigal son. Remember that story? The, st the end of that story is the son, the prodigal son comes back. He's embraced by the father, thrown a party. And what does the older son do? He gets all ticked off because he says, Dad, how can you forgive that guy, my brother, after all the loyalty I've given you? I deserve a party in a sense, not him. Look at all he's done. He's wasted all your money, and you're welcoming him back with open arms because you love him? That's what the older brother says. 
He's in the kingdom of this world. And God says, in my kingdom, regardless of who you are and what you've done, I love you because I can't help but love you. And I'm going to bring everybody and anybody in. And the kingdom of the world says we get what we deserve. The kingdom of heaven says we don't get what we deserve. We absolutely don't. Christ takes what we deserve in his kingdom to give us life that we don't deserve. That's the beauty of it. Last thing about the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of the world is that in the kingdom of heaven, there's a benevolent, gracious, and generous owner of the vineyard who is very fair. In other words, he tells all of the workers the same thing. You're going to earn this denarius regardless of when you are enter this work. At the end, they're, they're saying it's unfair, but reality is they all agree to the same thing. But the owner is dictating the rules. This is my kingdom. It's a benevolent kingdom. It's generous and kind. But I set the, I set the standards here, the ethos. In the world's kingdom, we like to feel like, even with God, we, we can negotiate. We think that maybe, as I said, merits, but also think about Adam and Eve. They were in God's kingdom, and they chose something different because, in a sense, they put themselves in the center. There's no owner anymore. I'm the owner of my life. I dictate things. The kingdom is about me in the kingdom of the world. Then it becomes a competition between this person and that person of which voice is going to be loudest or more influential to have the better voice because it's all about me and what I want and what I think is right. And I try to get what I think is right from those in power over me because I am right. And God's kingdom, God's kingdom says, look, his boundaries are good. Remember Psalm 16 says, uh, Psalm 16 says, the boundaries for me, O Lord, have fallen to me for in pleasant places. Your boundaries. God's desires for us. And there's limits to our life. Not based on anything that we've conjured up, but because of who God is. And so the King of kings and Lord of lords is the Lord of our church and Lord of our life in such gracious and kind ways, but certainly the one in charge. And then we, together, we come in humility before him, giving thanks for God's generosity and grace and kindness and the beautiful boundaries that he puts for us to protect us, to give us a life that he desires us to live which is good for us, good for us. So that's, the, that's the, a few dip contrasts between the kingdom of heaven and the parable and the kingdom of the world that's inside that parable as well. And my hope is that this morning as we receive the sacrament uh, in a bit, when we hear God's word, when we are together on a weekly basis, that we experience even more grace upon grace and as Jesus is they said about Jesus, you're full of grace and truth, that we are changed by this grace as we live in his kingdom, as we move from today into God's preferred future for all of us. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we love you. We thank you. We give you thanks for choosing us. Even when we are unworthy to be chosen, you chose us because you are good and kind and loving. And so we pray that as we receive your gift of grace again today, that it might change us from the inside out, to see others as you see them, to help us move and, uh, and live in you always. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
stand. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. United as one in the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come and receive Jesus, our strength for the wilderness. You may be seated. Sing 
Snow wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. As we pray together as a church, um, each petition today ends merciful God, and as a congregation we respond, receive our prayer. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. O oh God, you so love your church, Raise up leaders who care for your people. Bless lay theologians and seminary and college professors and all who are called to the ministry of teaching that they form and inspire us for the work of the gospel. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you so love your creation. Breathe new life into our planetary home. Guide the work of researchers, scientists, and activists who love your earth and inspire us to care for the natural world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you so love the world. Uphold leaders who resist tyranny and oppression. Strengthen organizations that work to promote peace and harmony. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you so love your people. Draw near to all who live with mental illness, depression, or addiction, and accompany them in healing and recovery. Hear the cries of those to look to you in their distress, in illness, or in injury, especially Bertie, Judy, Caroline Bushwack, Alicia Davis, Mike Hess, Jeffrey James, Cresta Jones, Paula Christinger, Eileen Neary, Jamie Nichols, Emily Scott, Pam Simpson, and Mike Wood. We give thanks for the birth of Simon Jacob to Jenny and Antonio and to big siblings, Eva and Henry. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Oh God, you so love your children. Bless the young in our midst and delight us with their joy, wonder, and curiosity. Revive our ministries with children and youth and equip us for all, all for faithful discipleship. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you so love your saints. As our ancestors in the faith have been a blessing to us, so inspire us by their example of holy living to be a blessing to those who come after us. We pray this week for comfort for the family and friends of Howard Rohr as they mourn. Merciful God, 
receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Okay. You may be seated. We have our giving moment first. Briefly for a giving moment, reflecting on what Patty Peterson shared with us in our Faith in Life podcast a couple weeks ago. So Greg and I interviewed uh, Patty Peterson, who's our office, or works in our office. She's the parish administrator for here. And uh, we asked her uh, what she likes about St. Luke, and she gave us three reasons. One, location. She likes where we're at, um, right on Morse Road. A lot of people pass by and stop in, and we have availability for our space for many and various ways we use this space uh, to bless the community around us. Number two, she said, uh, she um, appreciates the generosity of those who are here. Uh, she said, um, her, she, can, she said, I can look at my apartment and see all the people that donated furniture to her when she moved here from Los Angeles five years ago. And it was because of the generosity, hands-on generosity from this congregation that helped her get settled here at St. Luke and in Columbus, Ohio. And then she said, the third thing is she just loves the staff and she's appreciative how uh, this, she goes, I've worked in a lot of churches in Southern California. Before she came to Columbus, she said, this staff is the best staff she's ever worked on and uh, how supportive we are of one another. And I share all those things because, you know, that's Patty's experience, but you might have your own experiences as well with St. Luke that if uh, you would say, here's my reasons. And we can only do those things because of generosity from people like you. And so uh, if you're able to share uh, with us and become a giver at St. Luke, you can go to stlukeclumbus.com forward slash giving. You can become a one, you can give a one-time gift or become a recurring giver. Regardless, that giving allows us to have impact with Patty's life and everybody's life around us as we continue life together. A few other announcements. Um, there's two more weeks of collecting fleece um, before the fleece uh, blanket tying extravaganza, um, which you can sign up for on your connection card, which is a reminder to please sign a connection card, um, both um, either whether you're here with us in person or whether you're um, worshiping with us online. Um, the other reason to make sure you, uh, you turn in a connection card is because it helps our Wednesday night meal hosts know how many they're preparing for. So if you're going to come for the meal and worship on this Wednesday night in Lent, um, please sign a connection card um, so that those who are preparing the meal know how many to prepare for. Um, our theme this coming week um, during our discussion time during the worship is living our baptism, hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper. So um, we'll be discussing what it means as a baptized person to um, participate in uh, God's word and God's meal. And also a reminder for those of you who were here on Wednesday night and um, a, a new word if you were not here on Wednesday, um, we're doing a Lent photo challenge. So each week's theme, I'm inviting you to look for that idea in the world for the following week. And last week was living among God's faithful people. So take a look around you and see who exhibits um, faithful living, um, who inspires your faith in the world around you, and um, snap their photo with their permission, and, um, and send it to me, and we will put them all together and um, share them in worship on Wednesday, and hopefully share them on our social media, so we get a chance to see what we're seeing out in the world. All right, please stand and receive the benediction. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Amen. Let's finish with our song. Every black.
peace and serve the Lord.